All right, welcome everybody to our Synthetic Biology Journal Club for Friday, April 23rd. Uh, so the topic today is on the uh, Ring of Fire project, which was a 2014 iGEM winner um, by Team Heidelberg. Uh, 2014 was actually the same year that uh, we were there with our Real Vegan Cheese project with uh, Counterculture Labs and BioCurious. Um, so this team, um, undergraduate team, uh, accomplished an amazing amount of work. Um, they probably accomplished about four or five times more than what they would have needed to get in the finalists, uh, or, or what would have been expected for from like a graduate team, for example. Um, let me turn on the share screen. All right. Uh, so the problem they're trying to solve is how to circularize proteins, right? So, you know, you know, proteins, they're a string of amino acids. So you have two ends, you have an N terminal and a C terminal. Um, turns out that there's ways to tie those two ends of the proteins together, essentially. And what that buys you is that if you get a much more heat stable protein, typically. Right, so if the two ends are just flopping around all over the place, that provides an easy way for uh, protein degrading enzymes, proteases, to start attacking and degrading that protein. If you tie them together, uh, that makes for a much more compact protein and typically much more heat stable as well. There's no more uh, possibility for uh, proteases to start digesting the protein from the outside in, essentially, starting from the ends. Um, now, circular proteins uh, are quite unusual in nature. Uh, they do occasionally occur, but they're mainly uh, something that we've engineered. Um, they are not that normal in nature. Um, the technique that they're using to actually tie these ends together is uh, called intines. Um, can I advance the slides? Yes. Uh, and they're actually uh, using what's called split intines. And let me take a little detour and explain what intines are. Let me uh, share a different screen here. Uh, where am I? Just a sec. So, um, they're using something that you might be more familiar with from, um, from DNA actually, rather than from proteins, which is introns and exons. Uh, so you might remember uh, that in eukaryotic genomes, uh, the genes are often encoded sort of in, in chunks, right? So you have exons, which are the parts of the gene that actually code for the protein sequence, separated by introns, which are uh, pieces of DNA that actually get cut out to assemble the full mature messenger RNA that then gets translated into proteins, right? So uh, there's a whole piece of machinery in eukaryotes that will splice out these introns. So this is all happening at the RNA level, essentially, before uh, the, the mRNA gets translated into proteins. All right. So intron, that name stands for uh, intragenic uh, region. Intragenic meaning it's a region inside of the gene. Uh, and then exons are the part that actually gets to be, you know, part of the, the coding sequence. So all of this happens at the RNA level. You have something similar happening in some proteins at the protein level, at the protein sequence level, amino acid sequence level. So that's called protein splicing, right? So imagine you have a, a long... Uh, uh, protein sequence here on the left that's sort of indicated in red with sort of this little zigzag to indicate the end of the protein. 
Then you have an intein sequence, which is part of uh, the protein itself. So that's just uh, uh, an amino acid sequence. Um, and then you have the remainder of the protein indicated by the, the blue region here. And this intein is essentially autocatalytic. It has a, it's a specific amino acid sequence that catalyzes its, its own uh, removal from the rest of the protein. Right? So it enables uh, um, sort of these two ends to splice together, essentially. So there's a set of reactions, and at the end, you wind up just with uh, the blue part of the protein tied to the, uh, or the red part of the protein tied to the blue part of the protein, right? And the intein itself has spliced itself out, right? So that's what a, a regular intein is. Um, now, it turns out you can kind of cut this intein in half, right? So now you would have two proteins here, one with sort of half of this intein and then a second protein with the other half of the intein. Um, but the two still work together, right? And if that split intein then functions, now you've attached this blue part to the, or the red part to the blue part, even though they were part of a uh, separate parts of a, of, of a protein, for example. So if you do that between the C terminal of a protein and the N terminal of the same protein, you've essentially circularized that protein. Does that make sense? Could you clarify again? Sure. So this is this intein mechanism is normally used in nature uh, to uh, where it essentially it splices itself out of a protein, right? So it's mm -hmm. a specific protein domain that catalyzes its, its own removal from the protein, right? So uh, you start out with a long protein with this intein in the middle. And at the end of this reaction, you wind up with that intein removed from the rest of the protein. Okay. All right. Now, mm -hmm. it turns out you can split that intein in half, right? So instead of one long protein here, you might have two separate proteins, you know, protein A with half of the intein, protein B with the other half of the intein. And this combination of these two halves of the intein still work in the sense that after the reaction, you wind up with, you know, protein A and protein B stuck together. Okay. Right now, what if we do this in such a way that you know, rather than protein A and protein B, these are actually the two ends of the same protein, right? So imagine there's a bunch of sequence here connecting these two ends together. So this would be the C terminal end of the protein. This would be N terminal end of the same protein. Okay. Uh, now, when the split intines sort of splices itself out, you wind up with a circular protein. Oh. Does that make sense? So basically, so basically when the intine proteins are removed, when they splice themselves out, they can sort of coalesce to form a circular protein? Yeah. So the intine will remove itself here and will we'll attach this part to that part. They attach right. the amino, the wait, the R group or the amino part? Hmm? The R group or the amino part? The amino uh, so if you look at uh, the bottom here, and this is just the, uh, the Wikipedia page for protein splicing. So you can find this information there. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, I can only just minute, let me put it on a slightly smaller font size. There we go. Now we can see the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. So it will actually attach uh, this carbon. Carbonyl carbon. To this nitrogen. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a split intine, so you split this in half here, uh, and you attach this half to the N-terminal of a protein, 
-hmm. And then you attach the other half to the C terminal of the same protein. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. After the intines sort of splice themselves out, you're going to have circularized that protein. Oh, okay. That makes sense? Yes, yes. I know, it's kind of confusing. This technique is often used to just splice two proteins together. Oh, okay. right. So you would have uh, a split intein, you would have two small domains that you can attach. You know, you attach one to the N-terminal of one protein and the other to the C-terminal of the other protein. And after they do their thing, the two proteins are fused together, essentially. So on the one hand, we had DNA splicing, or and then now we have protein splicing. Yeah. So it's named in analogy to introns, right? So these are called extines because that's what's remaining after the splicing happens. This is called an intein because it's sort of a, it's the analog, an analogous sort of uh, uh, structure to an intron. Uh, right. They're called an intein because now it's a protein intron, quote unquote. Um, but the, the naming is sort of in analogy to uh, mRNA splicing. Cool, cool. Yeah, interesting. This is uh, this is new for me too. I, yeah, yeah, no, it's a really yeah, cool that, trick in synthetic yeah, biology beautiful. just on its own, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but this is definitely not in the MCAT. <laughs> I said, this oh, is yeah. not in the MCAT. No, no, this is, uh, have... yeah, this is some pretty weird biology. <laughs> but that's often where we find our tools to do uh, bioengineering, right? It's in the weird biology that we can harness to do interesting things. Cool, cool. Uh, so this had been known before, right? So we, we know that these intines exist and other people had already made the split intine system uh, this is actually mentioned on the Wikipedia page here. You see some of the references on split intines. Um, so the first thing that this team did, so let's go back to our Ring of Fire team here. Let's uh, switch back to the presentation. If I can find it. All right. So the first thing that our uh, Ring of Fire team did was actually make a toolbox to use this split intein system. Um, so they made a bunch of bio bricks, uh, sort of in the, the standard bio brick uh, format, so that any iGEM team in the future now can use this system if they want to tie two proteins together. Right. Nice. Um, so here you see the, the split intine, right? So mm -hmm. um, just like in the Wikipedia page, you would have this intermediate uh, domain here that it gets spliced out, except that domain has been split in half, right? So you can literally attach one half to one protein, the other half to the other protein, but it still works as an intine altogether. Nice. So again, if you do that with two ends of the same protein, you wind up circularizing the protein. All right. Oh. And again, the references here go back to 1999. You know, this has been around for a while. Um, it hasn't seen all that much use because you know it's a little, um, it's a little finicky to work with, and nobody really made sort of an, a, an easy toolbox for utilizing this technique. But it had been around for a while. Okay. Um, so some examples that have been published. So you can, uh, on some proteins where the CNN terminal are close together, you can actually circularize them like beta-lactamase. Uh, GFP, again, the CNN terminal can be brought fairly close together and the GFP will still work um what they're the first one that they're trying to do is a uh, xylanase where we already know that cnn terminal fairly close together so this should be a good opportunity to demonstrate that their uh, split in team methods for circularization works right um 
close proximity of termini allows direct circularization. Um, and then you can stabilize it further by using disulfide bonds. So you have, if you have cysteines, uh, cysteine amino acids uh, in your uh, protein, those can often uh, bind to each other as well. So you can further stabilize uh, the protein. Uh, Alright, so, uh, and they show that, uh, you know, in their system, this does actually work, right? So, uh, you have a, uh, a linear form of the protein here on the left band, and after circularization, uh, the protein is actually a little bit more compact, so even though it's the same length, it actually migrates uh, a little bit further on the gel. And you often see that with like linear versus circular DNA as well. It will migrate to a gel at different speed. Um, and you also have the bands for the actual intines that have spliced themselves out. These are very small fragments corresponding to the intine that has removed itself. So, so first off, you know, they uh, they made a toolkit and they showed that the toolkit works on this uh, xylase. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they show that it indeed has uh, much more heat resistance. Um, so if you look at, you can barely see it here, um, but they're they're following sort of a, they're doing a fluorescent assay to show the activity of the xylanase, right? So they're adding. Um, Xylanase is a uh, an enzyme that deconstructs xylan, which is a, a polysaccharide, uh, and you have fluorescent uh, substrates that look like xylan, where if you cleave them, the thing becomes fluorescent essentially. Right, so you can just add that enzyme and then show follow the the amount of fluorescence that is being generated over time, and then show. Uh, how the progression of that fluorescence changes depending on depending on temperature, right? So you have two graphs here at 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, the top one here for the orange is actually circular. The bottom one is linear. So it actually works a little bit better than the linear form, uh, but at 37 degrees Celsius, it's fairly similar. Uh, if you raise it to 63 degrees Celsius, then you see pretty much no activity from the linear form, but you still see uh, fairly good activity for the circular form, right? Uh, so they're, they're showing that, yes, they can circularize the enzyme, and it is still active, and it is more heat stable, right? So that alone would be enough to, you know, probably put you in the finals. Uh, you actually design something and show that it works and show that it still has activity after you've done your pro your protein engineering on it. Um, so that was first step. Uh, so engineering a heat stable xylanase. Now they picked an easy one here where the C and N terminal, the two ends of the protein were very close together. Right. Uh, what if uh, the two ends are not close together? What if they're on opposite sides of the protein and facing away from each other? Right. Now, if you try and tie those two ends together, you're going to disrupt the entire protein. Right. So it's unlikely to still be active once you tie those ends together. Uh, so that's why they're talking about uh, designing linkers. Right? Can we actually design a piece of intermediate amino acid sequence that will uh, tie these two ends together without disrupting the shape of the rest of the protein? Right. Um, so a lot of people use flexible linkers where you're sort of using an arbitrary sequence of fairly flexible amino acids. And then you, know, you put a sequence in between that's long enough and you hope for the best. Um, what they're trying to do is actually design rigid linkers, sort of knowing 
how far these ends are away from each other and knowing which direction they're facing, can we actually design sort of a, a series of, of rigid uh, little beams essentially that uh, tie those two ends together and keep the protein in the same original conformation. Um, so that's an interesting uh, design problem. And there are they're separating in, into uh, finding rigid rods and angles. And they're actually doing that by mining the protein database. So they're mining this database of you know thousands of uh, known protein structures from X-ray crystallography, and they're finding alpha helices that are are forming sort of reliable rods. And then they're finding intermediate sequences that form reliable angles, right? So they're they're finding sort of these small intermediate sequences that occur in multiple proteins, and reliable seems to generate a specific angle in that protein. Right. Um, that gives them essentially a library of rods and angles to work with. Uh, for every angle, they want to have a short sequence that they can implement that angle with. And here's some of the, the specific uh, angles that they've mined from the PDB database. Right. Um, then, um, let's see. And then they have a software tool that will essentially implement all of this. So you give it a random protein of interest, and you do need to know the protein structure of your protein of interest, because you need to know exactly how far apart the two ends of the protein are and in which direction they are pointing. And with that information, they will design a set of rods and angles that exactly meets up uh, those two ends while avoiding the rest of the protein. You also don't want to go like straight through the protein, right? That, that wouldn't be good. Um, so they have a software program that uh, does that whole thing essentially called Kraut Circularization with Rods and Angles of Unlinked Termini. Uh, so again, you start out with the two ends at specific locations. Uh, and specific angles, and in I believe they were all, always doing sort of the, the three rod conformation. Uh, so you have a rod that starts from uh, the end terminal in the direction that end terminal is pointing. You have a rod that starts at the C terminal in the direction the C terminal is pointing, and then you have sort of an intermediate rod. And they're making uh, a large number of possible linkers, and then they're scoring them to see which ones are the best ones. Um, so, and again, you can make like three rod linkages or two rod linkages. Uh, if you want, you can do four rod linkages if you want, and you could, if you can score them in some way, you can select the what is likely the best solution for your particular protein. Right. Uh, if you know where the active site is for the protein, uh, so if it's an enzyme that sort of binds a specific ligand in a specific location on the, on the enzyme, you can also take that into account to avoid that active site with your linkers. Right. Uh, so if you had a linker that passed straight in front of the active site, it might bind, it might avoid ligand binding, and that would not be good, even though it's not going like through the protein or anything. It might still obstruct its functionality. All right. So um, the protein that they picked as demonstration is a uh, lambda phage lysozyme, uh, and there's just you know, they, they, they picked one that had the right properties to demonstrate what they wanted to demonstrate, right? Uh, it's one that needs a linker, so the N and C and terminal are far enough apart. You can easily express the E. coli. They don't need purification to true activity. 
and there's a standardized assay to actually show that it's active. For lysozyme, that is easy to do. Um, and they show that it worked. Um, let's see, is this already the results on, oh, this is the linker screening. Um, this is just an example of the activity assay. I don't think this is actually on their engineered enzyme yet. Um, they came up with, let's see, nine constructs. So nine, out of their different ways of constructing these linkers, they came up with nine different ones and then tested them using this uh, activity assay. So this is for the linear isozyme. And you see the uh, enzymatic activity. You can plot versus temperature, and you see that it, it goes down with temperature. Uh, I would ignore that they're showing it going up here. This is probably just leveling out here. Um, and this is what you get with a flexible linker. So you can circularize with a flexible linker uh, but it doesn't become any more heat stable, right? Um, this is what you get with a rigid linker that has a low score with their scoring algorithm. So it's actually even worse than uh, the linear version. And this is what you get with a high scoring rigid linker. Right? So it still has pretty much the same uh, activity at low temperature, but it's uh, a lot more stable at high temperature, a lot more active at high temperature, right? Uh, so um, that's the second protein they engineered and showed that it works. So now with their linkers, right? Um, that's the validation that their system works. Uh, they built an entire uh, version of folding at home uh, called iGEM at home uh, to implement all of this because this is a fairly computationally intensive uh, problem. Um, you need to do a lot of sort of structural modeling to uh, design these linkers. Um, and they got the whole bunch of uh, people from all various countries involved in working on this. Uh, let's see. So that's their in silico design of circularized linkers. Um, and then just as an encore, they have a beautiful application of this technology. They've already shown that the technology works, right? With the, the lysozyme, they showed it works on there. Uh, now, what are some places where you might want to have a more heat stable enzyme? Right. A more heat stable lysozyme is not terribly interesting. It's a good demonstration that it functions. There's not particularly good applications for it. Um, they're coming up with a, um, what they're calling PCR 2.0. Uh, so normally when you do PCR, polymerase chain reaction, you're copying DNA strands and you're doing it essentially in an exponential fashion, right? You start out with one double-stranded uh, DNA. After one round of PCR, you have two. Second round, you have four. Third round, you get eight. So you get an ex exponential increase of the amount of DNA. Um, what is not being copied is the possible methylation on top of that DNA. So you may have heard of epigenetics, right? Um, so epigenetics is typically implemented by having various uh, nucleotides across your DNA being methylated. And that sort of acts as sort of like a little, you know, a, a little annotation in the margin saying you shouldn't be expressing this gene or you should be expressing this gene. It would be really useful if we could do a PCR and copy these methylations on the DNA as well, right? Uh, to do that, there is actually in nature, and there's a, a, an enzyme called DNA methyltransferase that will copy the methylation pattern from one strand of DNA to the other strand, 
right? So if we have epigenetic markings on our DNA, when the DNA replicates, we need to maintain those markings on the, 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 the newly formed DNA, and that DNA metal transferase does that. Problem is, it's not heat stable, so you cannot use it in PCR. Because PCR, you have to heat things up to almost boiling point, essentially. And if you do that with, uh, in the presence of DNA metal transferase, you're going to degrade your metal transferase. Turns out if you had a heat stable version of that DNA metal transferase, you add it to a regular PCR reaction, uh, you get a PCR reaction where you copy the methylation patterns as well. Uh, so that's what they're what they're aiming for here. Yeah. So that just shows again sort of what I explained. Um, methylation is attached to individual uh, nucleotides. When you uh, replicate your DNA, you form a new strand, and you want to uh, copy the methylation pattern onto the opposite strand as well. So you wind up with the same as the original parent DNA, right? Uh, so that process, this part is just DNA replication. So that's uh, uh, DNA polymerase, right? This part to go from uh, having methylation pattern only on one strand versus having it on both strands, that is done by the metal transferase. Um, so here's what uh, metal transferase looks like, right? So you see the, they've color-coded here the, the two ends of the protein. And you see that they're fairly far apart from each other. And this end is pointing that way, that end is pointing this way. If you design just a short linker, it would disrupt this yellow domain here, right? If you try to just take the shortest path from one to the other, it would go through this entire domain here that's in the way. Uh, this is the linker that they designed based on their system. So it sort of goes, it's a little bit hard to see here. You can see that this yellow domain is in front of this purple. Um, so it starts out at, uh, I forget which one is the, the N or C terminal, uh, but it starts out at one end of the, the protein uh, and it takes a turn and then winds up at the other end of the of the protein, just tying them together. Uh, and the other important part here that's listed, this little circular thing, this is actually the, the DNA. Uh, so you're looking end on the, uh, the double helix of uh, a piece of DNA where you're copying over the, uh, uh, the methylation pattern. So you want to stay away from this part, which luckily is not hard to do since the, the two ends are actually quite far away from the active site. Right. So they apply their technique to uh, metal transferase and they show that it works. Um, so you can show that uh, the circularized version, um, let's see, you get methylated and undigested versus unmethylated. Uh, and showing the results here uh, for the circular form versus the linear form, and at three different temperature regimes, right? So for the linear form, um, you wind up with a uh, unmethylated digested form of the DNA, I believe is what they're showing here. Whereas with the circular form at high temperature, you, you get a little bit of this unmethylated, but uh, most of it remains in the same state as at uh, 37 degrees Celsius. Um, So yeah, so you get a, diff a significant difference in activity at higher temperatures. Um, and 
you definitely see the activity going down with at even higher temperatures, but it still stays significantly above the, the linear form. Um, and then they actually show that this works in a PCR reaction. Right, so you have, uh, now we have six cycles of uh, PCR amplification, and they show that with their uh, circularized metal transferase, you actually get a PCR reaction that copies over the, uh, the methylated uh, form of the, the DNA. Let's see, was there another? Oh, no. yeah. So yeah, they created a whole new form of PCR that uh, normal PCR is not able to do. Um, and then the last bit that they showed here is sort of making the toolbox for these entines. So you can get uh, sort of on and off switches on these entines. Um, they're actually designing a whole library of these entines that are around. Um, they're putting some of these entines under blue light control. So you actually just shine a light on this thing and it does its intine thing. Um, yeah. As I said, any of these four that they're, that are uh, showing here would be enough to land them in the, in the finalist, I think, for iGEM. Absolutely, yes, yes. Let's see, is there any more in here? claiming their achievements. There's sort of some one of the things you have to do at iGEM. You have to be very explicit about what you've accomplished so that uh, the judges will actually take into account for the awards. So that's what they're doing here. Uh, and then the acknowledgments. Yeah, this is a bunch of undergraduates. Pretty amazing. Uh, of course, I'm sure they had really good mentors and all of that, but that's with these iGEM teams, it's always the students that do the, the bulk of the work, so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is Quite this amazing. is really interesting, yeah. yeah. It is interesting, yeah. The Heidelberg cool. team has has gotten some really good uh, teams year after year. Uh, so I think they have a really good synthetic biology program. Uh, and yeah. They, this is probably students that came out of like a multi-year uh, synthetic biology program at Heidelberg. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they, they always, they, they always, uh, yeah, they always has uh, a good team. I mean, I, when I started judging when 2018, they every year have, you know, they had definitely good, uh, mm -hmm. especially, uh, uh, yeah, the post, everything, yeah, they, they, they're really good. Yeah. Any questions? I know I went over this a little bit fast, and there's so much in here in this project. Um, for entertainment purposes, you can have a look at what their poster looked like. I don't know if I have this open on here. I think I have it open on the, in my in the website. Hang on a sec. Let me switch over. They managed to squeeze all of that in a single poster. There we go. Yeah, so they're explaining how intines work, the intine toolbox that they generated, uh, the linker modeling, all of that is all sort of computational, hardcore structural biology modeling um making the libraries for these rods and angles uh screening the linkers computationally first and then finding uh, a good application where you can actually screen experimentally uh for the activity of the linker um prove that you actually get circularization on first this heat stable xylanase and then on the uh, lysozyme, and then building this PCR 2.0, where you can copy over the uh, uh, the methylation patterns, uh, 
the epigenetic marks on the DNA, essentially. Right. Yeah, tons of work. Any questions in this? I know I can't possibly have explained all of this perfectly, so <laughs> feel free to ask questions. It was pretty clear, actually. I really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. All right. If there's no more questions, then uh, we'll call it there for our uh, our journal club for this week. And we just need to figure out what we're going to present two weeks from now. I'll uh, go ahead and stop the recording here.